Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, another warm welcome to our service here at Forest Baptist Church this morning. Uh, we're going to read together to begin our service from John's Gospel, chapter 11, and we're going to continue with looking at the passage that we started last week with uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So we're going to read from John 11. We're going to break into the chapter at verse 17 and read down to verse 44 this morning. So John 11 from verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated at the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had left him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a man born blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odour, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Amen. So reads God's holy word to our hearts this morning. Just a reminder to people that we are beginning our prayer meetings from this evening, uh, half past six at Clovenside Chapel uh, and the discipleship groups start. We only have two running. They'll both be at Clovenside, one on Tuesday night at half past seven till nine o'clock and one on Thursday morning from half past 10 till 12 o'clock. Uh, please bring a face mask with you. You will not be allowed in without one. And please bring your own Bible as well, as we cannot hand out Bibles or, or materials to share with other people. Shall we come before the Lord in prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the Lord God Almighty, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I thank you that you are the glorious God who reigns in glory, who came from glory, who resides now in glory, who will bring your people to glory. You are almighty, majestic, perfect, 
righteous, holy, holy, holy. And we thank you, Father, that you are our glory as we share in the glory of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for those words from the passage we've just read when, when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, come forth, come out of death, come out of the grave, come back to life and life in its fullness. Father, you call us forth this morning. You call us forth into your forgiveness through Jesus Christ. You call us forth into the joy of the Lord to experience your joy. You call us forth into your cleansing, the cleansing power of Jesus' blood. You call us forth into your rest, to rest from our works and our labours and to accept your perfect righteousness. You call us forth to your light, to your truth, that we may abide and live in both. And Lord, you call us forth into your grace. And I thank you for that this morning, for your grace is always sufficient for us. When we are weak, you remain strong. Lord, you are our all in all, the all sufficient one. You are all that we need. So we are glad this morning to come into your presence and worship you, O oh God, our very great Redeemer. Hear our prayers, we pray this morning, we ask all of these things in the blessed name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's turn to that passage that we read together, shall we, this morning. So Lazarus has died. He's been in the grave for four days. Mary and Martha, his sisters, have called on the Lord and Jesus is now present with them at the graveside. And Christ has made his bold declaration, I am the resurrection and the life. And he urges Martha to believe that he can help her in her present trouble. Upon which Martha makes her concise declaration of faith in Jesus when she says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was coming into the world. And so the scene is set and the tension is rising and there's an eager expectation. Will Jesus, the Son of God, do something spectacular at this point? The situation is heightened when Jesus calls for Mary to come to verse 28, when she, Martha, had said this, that is her declaration of faith, she went and called her sister Mary saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. Now there are two reasons why it is interesting that Martha calls Jesus the teacher. Firstly, because the article is important. He was not a teacher, but the teacher teacher, someone who was incomparable to all other teachers. And secondly, the rabbis of the day refused to teach women, but Jesus was glad to be the teacher of women and to have female disciples. Martha didn't even have to use Jesus's name, just the teacher. These few verses alone raise for us some important questions for us to evaluate our own faith in Jesus Christ. Because firstly, do we hold Jesus to be the teacher in our lives? Not a teacher, but the teacher. Is Jesus one of many supposedly good influence in our, is in our lives? Or is he the sole influence, or at least the preeminent influence? There are, of course, multiple people and groups and voices all clamouring for our attention every time we turn on the TV or the radio or read a newspaper or website or open a book or have a conversation. There are, there are people trying to influence our thinking. This is simply part of living in the world without being a hermit. And I guess a more accurate way of putting it is 
given the multitude of voices that are constantly vying for our attention, do we resolutely measure everything we hear with the words of Christ in Scripture in order to know the truth? Is Jesus the teacher in our lives? For rest assured, the world is not a neutral arena. The kingdom of God is opposed to Satan and his ways. Unfortunately, whether the morals of Christianity used to uh, generally be accepted in our society, that is definitely not the case any longer. And much of the content of, of, of even primary school material is now influenced by those wishing to promote immorality as normal and healthy. One slide from the current Scottish curriculum for sex education and relationships designed for primary schools with input from the LGBT groups has Miles, age five, stating, love makes everyone feel good. So you should share your love with anyone and everyone you want to. Nobody should make you feel bad for that. Read the opening verses of Ephesians 2. Paul makes it clear that the, the thinking of this world, the ways of this world, the mindset of this world is under the power of Satan. It's not neutral, it's hostile to God and to God's kingdom. And God frees us from these things the moment he makes us alive in Christ. Firstly then, Mary and Martha knew Jesus as the teacher. And the term the teacher was more than enough for Mary to know who Martha was talking about. And listen to the response of Mary, verse 29. When she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. The Greek uh, indicates an action performed without delay. Mary immediately went to Jesus. So secondly then, it's worth asking ourselves, well, can we say the same? Do we immediately go to Jesus as our first port of call in all and every situation? Is he our last resort or is he our first resort? Do we try every other available option open to us or like Mary, go quickly and directly to him? There used to be a sign in an old textile mill that read, when your thread becomes tangled, call the foreman and a young woman who was new on the job got her thread tangled but she didn't want to bother the foreman so she thought well I'll just straighten it out myself and she tried but the, the situation just got worse that the thread got more tangled finally she called the foreman she said look I did the best that I could she said but it's just got worse no you didn't said the foreman to do the best you should have called me straight away. Now, how often do bad situations in our lives worsen because we are reluctant to rise quickly and go straight to Jesus? Is it just me or do we seem to have a knack of complicating the most simple of things? I think the old hymn was right when it said, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows for the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey jesus called mary went immediately and speedily she encapsulated the lyrics of trust and obey what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey Verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise up quickly and go out. They followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Again, isn't this an accurate reflection of our walk with the Lord? I find it interesting that Jesus didn't go all the way to Mary's house, but he stayed where he was. If Mary wanted to meet with Jesus, she needed to actively go to him. 
Mary believed Jesus could do something, but she still needed to go to him. We're not passive receivers as Christians. We are active receivers. And yes, every blessing that we have in Christ is given to us from the Father, through the Spirit, but we are often required to actively receive it. It's the pattern that we see throughout the Gospels. In Matthew 17, Jesus will miraculously provide the temple tax for him and his disciples, but Peter has to go and catch the fish in whose mouth the temple tax coin is. Jesus will give the multitude a, a fish supper, but not before the young boy prevents his two small fish to him. Jesus will heal the, the woman with the issue of blood, but not until she goes to him and touches the hem of his garment. Now, why does God often work in this way? Well, just imagine if he just gave us everything without asking, without us going to him, without actively receiving from him. We just had it all, everything we ever needed pre-served up on a platter. Would that be good for us? No, not at all. We would all become lazy and ungrateful and exceedingly proud. It's so easy to be lazy, isn't it? And the other day, I admit to my shame, I couldn't even be bothered to go downstairs to get my Kindle, so I, I texted one of the kids from the bedroom to ask if they could bring it up when they came upstairs. Now, in fairness, the only reason I did that was because I can't be bothered to train the dog to do it. And don't get me started on the cat. But here in our passage, you know, Mary chose to go to the Lord. Verse 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Mary didn't wait for Jesus to come to her. She went to where Jesus was. And her first response, her words are practically identical to Martha's. They both shared this firm conviction that Jesus could have prevented Lazarus's death. But that's as far as their faith seems to have reached at this point. Not that I think we can be too harsh on the grieving sisters, for let's face it, no one was expecting a resurrection here. Even within the, the repertoire of miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus did, the raising of the dead was an exceedingly rare occurrence. But as Christ once taught, with God, all things are possible. God responds to those who come to him in faith and not as an unfeeling automated robot because he must but with compassion because he loves us when jesus saw her weeping verse 33 and the jews who had come with her also weeping he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled the Greek here denotes a, a loud weeping, like, like wailing. This was no British stiff upper lip, just raw emotion expressed in considerable volume. And given the loud and the distressing environment, Ryu translates these verses as he, Jesus, gave way to such distress of spirit as made his body tremble. The scene was so heartrending, it moved Jesus greatly. The phrase deeply moved usually describes anger, coupled with a, with a noise like the snorting of horses. It's quite a graphic description. And many people have translated the phrase here as anger, but if anger was the intended meaning, it wasn't anger towards Mary and Martha nor to the Jews who accompanied them. There's nothing to suggest that their grief was not genuine. It would have been anger towards death itself and the effects of sin that caused death. B.B. Warfield said it is death that is the object of his wrath and behind death, him who has the power of death and whom he has come into the world to destroy. 
tears of sympathy may fill his eyes, but his soul is held by rage, and he advances to the tomb as a champion prepares for conflict. He hates what Satan has done to his image bearers. And just as Christ would soon face death and the grave himself, so he approaches Lazarus's tomb with the same determination, as well as the conviction of his assured victory. Verse 34. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. The people present may have thought that death and darkness had the upper hand in this situation, but Jesus knows he is the resurrection and the life. Death is a powerful foe, but the destroyer of death is more powerful still. It's at this point we get the shortest verse in scripture. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Did he weep for Mary and Martha? Possibly. Did he weep for Lazarus? Maybe, but it seems unlikely, seen as he going to raise him again from the dead did he weep for the sins of the world which brought death into the world and suffering and pain most assuredly i think jesus knew and experienced the full range of human emotions he knew loss he experienced death he saw injustice he suffered pain Hebrews 2 reminds us, doesn't it, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Since he himself has gone through this suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we're being tested. This is one of the reasons we should always go straight to him because he knows exactly how we feel. He has been there before us. The gathered crowd see the emotional reaction of Jesus, but, but notice how all their thinking is past tense. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? They don't doubt Jesus' love for Lazarus. They do question whether or not he could have done something before it was too late, that is, as it currently was. It reminds me of the beginning of the film The Fellowship of the Ring when Gandalf arrives in the Shire and Frodo states, you're late to which gandalf replies a wizard is never late frodo baggins nor is he early he arrives precisely when he means to now this could quite easily be said of christ as he fulfills his ministry he is never late nor is he early he arrives precisely when he means to he may not fit in with the timetables and the schedules of others, but he is always precisely where he means to be. The sisters both said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The gathered crowd say, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And it's as if Jesus has to say to them, hey, I'm here now. And I think this is something that we have to be reminded of often. For Jesus is as much present with us today through his spirit who dwells in his people as he was present with Mary and Martha at the graveside of Lazarus. But boy, aren't we just like Mary and Martha? How often have we thought, ah, oh, if Jesus was here, things would have been different for sure. No, hang on a minute. Didn't Jesus say, be sure of this, I am with you always to the end of the age. Has he not said, I will never leave you nor forsake you? As Christians, we are never without Christ's presence in our lives. He is present by the Spirit who lives within us. And here, Jesus is physically present at the graveside of Lazarus. He's right here with them. Has already expressed her faith in Christ's ability. Martha said, verse 21, to Jesus, 
Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. You can do, still do something. I know you can, states Martha. But when Jesus asks for the stone to be taken away from the grave, we read that Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odour for he's been dead four days. Now, isn't that another accurate reflection of us quite often? We know that God can do something in our situation, whatever that situation is. But when it comes down to it, we immediately raise an objection. We know that the Lord can do the impossible and yet we conclude but he probably won't. I wonder if the reason that we don't see God do many spectacular things in our lives today is because we don't expect them. Remember what the writer of the Hebrews exhorts his readers to believe? Without faith it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now we're pretty solid on the first part, we sure do believe God exists. It's the second part we're not so good at grasping, believing that he rewards those who seek him. If we did believe that fully, our prayer meetings would be full. Well, unlike Lazarus, uh, when Lazarus died, Jesus was, was now there. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. He's going to stink, says Martha. Take away the stone, says Jesus. Can you imagine the atmosphere among the mourners when Jesus tells them to take the stone away? The questions they must have asked, either silently or audibly. What was he going to do? What if nothing happens? Is Lazarus really going to return? Jesus said to her, verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? What an insight into the mind of Christ and a lesson for the gathered crowd. How much more could be achieved for God's kingdom and seeing it grow if his people believed? He may have said to the people, Did I not tell you? But his words are directed to us as forcefully this morning. He has told us, indeed, he is telling us as we look at this chapter this morning, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Yes, Jesus' power will be displayed. Yes, he will perform a great miracle. Yes, he will bring great comfort to Martha and Mary. But notice what is foremost in the mind of Christ. Christ's central concern is always the glory of God. And although many would see the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead, not everyone present would see the glory of God because only those who had faith in Christ would perceive its real significance. In the same way that many people are awestruck and dumbfounded by the beauty of creation and you know the mountains and sunsets, but only those who are born again of God's Spirit will understand that the heavens declare the glory of God. Verse 41, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus spoke out loud in order that the people would believe in him. The aorist tense used here points to the beginning of faith. Jesus wants people to begin believing in him. He wants them to see the miracle he will perform and know that he depends on the Father for everything and that his Father and himself are indeed one. We're told when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Now, it was commonly understood back then that it was the wizards, it was the occultists who muttered their incantations and spells. In Isaiah chapter 8 verse 9 it talks about the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. Well Jesus was no conjurer of cheap magic tricks. He didn't stand there muttering and murmuring. He cried out loudly and clearly, Lazarus come out! No hidden spell or mysterious enchantment here. Jesus gives a direct and forceful command for death 
to release its captive. Now can you imagine the scene at this point? All eyes must have been focused on the tomb. Intense stares fixed on the unsealed grave. The initial stillness, the tension, the straining into the darkness and then there it is, a first bit of movement. The man who did had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. People were wrapped in strips of bandage back then, much like the uh, classic Scooby-Doo mummy, if you're of my generation. And Jesus commands the people to loose the grave clothes and let the man go. Unbind him, free him. Get, get rid of those entangling strips. Lazarus no longer needs them. They are for the dead, not the living. Let him go. Mary and Martha's faith in the present Jesus resulted in them well and truly seeing the glory of God. And in fact, any active faith in the present Jesus would enable us to see the glory of God as he delivers us from sin, and from the power of sin in our lives. It's the devil's business to keep people in bondage to sin. It's the business of heaven to, for God to release people from sin and its power. And this is something that God has graciously done for us in Christ. As John writes in his first letter, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. When we come to, to Christ in active faith, he unplugs us from the power of sin. Think of uh, electricity flowing through a circuit. As long as the circuit remains unbroken and is connected to the main supply of electricity, the power continues to flow through it. Now, most of you will know what a short circuit is, even if you can't explain it in electrical terminology. It's something that attaches itself to the electrical current, but because it doesn't conduct electricity, the electricity builds up to excessive levels, but because it can't flow as it wants to, the thing will short circuit. The power source will be turned off. Well, Christ and his work on Calvary's cross was the short circuit of our sin. The power of sin that had flowed from one generation to the next through the circuit of natural birth ever since Adam disobeyed God was finally short-circuited when Christ broke his body and shed his blood for the sins of the world. When he was nailed to the cross, all the excessive levels of sin flowed into him and God charged him with the sins of the world so that sin and the power of sin could be broken. The power source of sin was turned off as Christ absorbed it in his own body on the cross and cried out, it is finished. So let me ask you this morning, have you accepted Christ as the circuit breaker of your sin? Have you trusted him to take your sin upon himself so that you can be forgiven of it? I guarantee you, if you come to Christ in faith, you will see the glory of God in his wonderful gift of forgiveness and salvation. For just as Christ can raise the dead Lazarus back to life, he can also raise those who are dead in sin and give them new life in the spirit. But friends, if you are a Christian this morning, let me also ask you, what bonds of the old sinful nature still bind you today? What lingering sins of your old life still seem to have power in your life? If Christ can deliver us from physical death and the grave, what is there that he can't spiritually deliver us from? If he has the power to deliver us from death and give us life and life eternal, do you think he doesn't have the power to deliver us from sin and sinful habits 
or free us from past hurts and traumas. Listen to Jesus' words to Lazarus. Unbind him and let him go. Whatever old sinful habits still wrap around our lives, whatever vestiges of sin still cling to our lives and bind us, whatever old hurts, deep wounds, past traumas, current damage still tries to maintain its grip on our lives, listen to the words of Jesus Christ to you this morning. Unbind him and let him go. Unbind her and let her go. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Freedom from death, from sin, from the power of sin and from guilt. That we might increasingly see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Oh Father, free us from those things which so easily ensnare us, past or present. Set us free that we may walk in the freedom of Christ, to know his joy, to walk in his righteousness, in the light of his word, unbind us, Lord, and set us free, we pray. Hear our prayers. We come to you in expectation that you hear and answer those who seek you in faith. We ask these things this morning in Jesus' precious name. To him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.